Yum, yum. Okay, we are live on air. <laughs> yeah, we are up. And uh, it's Friday the 13th in October, no less. And we are here with Warren Marshall, uh, game artist extraordinaire. Probably familiar. There he is. That's what he looks like. Although I think people probably know what you look like because you're pretty active in the community. <laughs> yeah, have a popular somebody, YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, have a popular YouTube channel. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, working in the games industry today and some of Warren's uh, preferred software techniques. He does a lot of customization if you've looked at any of his videos on YouTube. And uh, I think we'll just talk a little bit about gaming in general and what it's like to work in that industry or, or what it's like to get into it. Uh, Warren's a game industry veteran, and so he probably has some really good things to say about that. I noticed behind you, that looks like Gears of War. Is that the, the game you worked on? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I worked on all three of those when I was at Epic. And uh, as the projects got done, you could we get like a nice poster. And my wife surprised me one day. She framed them all. So we kind of hung them up in the living room. And <laughs> oh, that was nice. So what, yeah. Yeah. That was a nice surprise one day. So that's why they're back there. There you go. That was very supportive. She wasn't uh, like enough of the game stuff. Leave it at work. You know, she's letting you put it up in the home, show off a little bit. Yeah. No, she's cool with it all. All right. And you're in North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina, you told me earlier, correct? Yes. And, that's right. and so do you work remotely with game companies out there or you or what's located in Raleigh? Well, near Raleigh, we, you know, we have Epic Games and Boss Key Productions is here. Um, what is the name? Now I can't remember. The guys who do Rainbow Six are here. Oh, okay. God, that's going to come yeah. back to bite me. <laughs> uh, there's a few other ones. There's a few other ones. Too. I know some guys who work there, and they're going to rise on that. I'm popular sure. game, but I can't remember off the top of my head who makes that either. So, yeah, yeah. So there's there's a there's a fairly vibrant community in in a, in and around Raleigh that works on video games. It sounds like. I thought isn't yeah, Bethesda totally. somewhere around, or at least somewhat close by? Uh, they're up in Maryland. It's not a huge jump from here, but it's yeah. Right. Right. Not local. Uh huh. And do you ever work remotely with companies? Now it looks like you're uh, just a artist for hire, or you typically go in house. Oh, I, I'm I'm pretty much um, entirely remote. Uh, last two and a half years, I've been doing freelance art, and I work from home pretty much all the time. Oh, nice! Uh, so, especially on games. Especially on games. So when you yeah, why don't we let's back up a little bit? I think we're jumping ahead. I want to actually. I just kind of want to get the Warren Marshall story and. Get an idea of when you got into this industry, sort of what led you down to the path where you are today, um, what it's like being able to work at home and work on games versus maybe being maybe earlier in your career, you're working in house at a studio or something like that. Just kind of give us an idea of, of how you got into this. Well, uh, uh, my path in was through level design. I, I was making custom levels for, for Quake and Doom 2 and stuff uh, back in the day. And, that like got me into that community. Like like mods? Like you were just creating your own? I uh, was just making levels you could play through, not actual mods, just... Oh, just, know, the, create, just creating levels, releasing them, and they had some... Yeah, yeah using the stock stuff and just making custom levels. There was a whole community built around that uh, way back in the 90s. Right. And uh, so that got me some... Uh, that got me into that community and hooked me up with a friend who, who was getting contract work with Legend Entertainment. Uh, they were working on the Wheel of Time game back then. That's probably too old a reference for most people. <laughs> and uh, so I got on there uh, doing contract stuff. They eventually made me an offer, and I uh, moved to Virginia to work with them. And that was my in. And uh, that was your. So did you? Was that the idea behind it when you started creating some custom levels and releasing them, or were you just having fun with uh, Doom and Quake? Yeah, actually, when I first started doing it, it was just like a. Um, a creative thing that I hadn't really thought about how uh, you could get paid to do it. Like, obviously, somebody was because I was you know, playing these games, but it never occurred to me you could get hired away in doing that. And then about uh, when the Quake stuff started up, that's when people started talking about, oh, you can get a job at this startup or this startup doing that stuff. And that's when it became a possibility of, hey, maybe I can make a job out of this. And this is early 90s. Is this early or mid 90s or approximately when is this? Uh, I think Quake came out in 93, so probably mid 90s. Yeah, I mean, early '90s, mid '90s. You, people have to remember if you're, if you're, <laughs> if you're our age, like that's still dial-up internet time for a lot of people. You know, it, it, yes. it, it, it's a different world, and these communities are just forming. It's not like there was a Twitch or someplace like that. You're probably on just a text-only. I'm guessing maybe a text-only forum 
or something like that, chatting with people and releasing things, and that was sort of your feedback. I'm guessing was that is that is that close to correct? In terms of being a feedback loop yeah. with other well, people, yeah, uh, I really didn't. Well, back then I didn't really have a feedback loop. I just sort of made what I wanted to make and released it, and people, you know, would send you a note if they liked it or something. But uh, the internet was kind of getting off of its, you know. Uh, uh, on his feet that you know in those days i guess so i did have dial up we did have some forums there were some websites for stuff but it wasn't like it is today with you know youtube and all this stuff it's yeah it's nothing like so that, much better today yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I would think so i think if you're um, interested in getting started in the industry today and being able to uh just connect with people much more easily but it's interesting that that i mean it, it happened fairly quick, quickly. Like in your case, once you're online and in, in, like in the early nineties, even if you are dial up, you are connected to people. And uh, it sounds like one thing kind of quickly led to another. How did you find yourself in a sitting in a room getting an interview though? Did you, did you apply for a job? Well, it was sort of through that. Um, I knew a friend who was doing that contract work, like I said. So I said, Hey, can I get some of that action? And he was like, sure, I'll hook you up with the design guy or whatever. And so, through doing that contract work, um, they eventually decided that, you know, hey, we should make this full time and they flew me out. But there wasn't really like an interview because they already sort of knew me from the right. you know, offsite work. Right. So you know, I, I kind of got it easy in there. I didn't have to do the whole uh, the sweaty interview process or anything. Well, what were you doing to pay the bills prior to that? Oh, I spent uh, probably seven or eight years writing uh, a business software. Uh, stuff that runs truck dealerships and car dealerships and that kind of stuff. Oh wow! So you were actually coding. You were actually. Oh yeah. Yeah, I spent a good. Yeah, yeah. I was a programmer primarily. Doing level design is kind of a fun side thing, and then I uh, decided that that was actually more fun than the programming. So I kind of went that way. And so programming to level design now to really an artist. Were you? Did you always have artistic ability, or is there something you discovered you had? at some point while working at a game studio. Uh, it kind of happened later. Um, so so I was at Legend Entertainment working on Wheel of Time, and, and we started up the uh, the prototype phrase for Unreal 2, uh, which was just getting rolling. And so during that time, uh, Unreal Tournament had come out a few months ago. And so I made a level for that, released it, uh, which Cliff Blazinski noticed. And, and that got us talking sort of thing. And so that's about the time that I got hired by Epic and, and moved there. And that was that was partly on the strength of level design, but partly on the strength of I was also working in code, uh, finishing up the new version of the Unreal Editor. Because Tim Sweeney had started this rewrite in C++, and he ran out of time and didn't want to finish it. And so I asked him if I could hack on it while I was at Legend. He said, sure, that's fine, whatever. Yeah, and that kind of evolved into part of what I did at Epic for the longest time. Was just, maintaining and improving a real ed. Oh, interesting. So that, that's a little bit different path. I wouldn't have um, guessed that. There are a number of artists who uh, eventually pick up program and they start with maybe scripting and maybe move on. Um, even Matt Cox, a developer at uh, Foundry who, who works on the procedural aspect of Moto, uh, started off as an artist, I know. He just sort of picked up programming. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, but you, you typically with art, you kind of at least Oftentimes, you kind of feel like you either either got it or you don't. And if you don't, you just don't get into it. So it is interesting that you started off with programming and then moved your way into the realm of artists. Yeah, I've, I've, I've thought about it before, and I'm not exactly sure what happened. <laughs> there. But be, I think it's the level design kind of evolved. It's basically the same thing on a macro level, right? You've got these large polygons that make up the wall, and you stitch them together and texture them. And it kind of, uh, the progression from there to making props was not a huge leap, yeah, except that now you're into all the tech details with normal maps and stuff like that. What, were you, did you start doing that just as a matter of necessity to get your work as a programmer to go a little faster? You know what, I'm just going to make some of this stuff myself. I just want to keep moving ahead. Or are you like, you know what, that, these guys over here seem to have a kind of a cool job. Maybe I want to move into this area. Uh, uh, it was partly that because I saw the artists on Gears of War and it looked like it was a lot of fun. But um, I think what actually drove me to start fooling around with 3D modeling was that I wanted to have custom stuff that would go into my level, like specifically built for it that would fit you know, a certain spot or something. 
-hmm. And that's what kind of drove me to get into it. And uh, yeah, it just kind of spiraled from there, I think. Right, sort of right, right. It's an interesting question. I haven't thought a whole lot about it, but I think that's what happened. <laughs> Something along those lines. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's an interesting story. So, Gears of War. So, I remember playing Unreal Tournament back in the day in the early 90s. That was the type of thing you did after work. You would, uh, you know, everybody would finish up. This is, you know, when I was a, uh, as a 3D animator at a production company in Silicon Valley, we'd wrap up, we'd play Unreal Tournament, or we'd play uh, like Half Life Deathmatch or, you know, something like that. Um, Gears of War was a pretty seminal game. I mean, that, you know, launched with the X, it launched with the Xbox, right? That was a launch title for the yeah. original Xbox? Um, God, why can I remember that? Pretty damn close. If it was, they definitely- It was it. close. Um, yeah. Yeah, and at least it was, it's, it's yeah, I think maybe it was the first. Sorry, the connection's weird. Uh, I think it was a, it, in the six to nine month window after the console came out, but yeah, it was one of the initial ones. Yeah, it's certainly going to be is remembered as a sort of a seminal release for Xbox. And uh, so, what did you? So, th uh, the most recent one came out just a few months ago. Actually, had a really good. Seems like it had a, had a good re uh, response in the industry. Is that something that you still pay attention to since you were part of the original uh, franchise? Uh, I I kind of keep it interested, you know, kind of eye toward it, but I don't really follow it or anything. Right, right. Yeah, yeah uh, I had like a date of Gears of War, kind of Gears of War out right now. <laughs> well, what's that? Oh, you're sort of Gears Gear of War out. I can imagine that's a great. How how many years did you work on that before it was released? Oh, before it was released, uh, the initial game was. Yeah, I should have researched this. Um, it was a couple years. I mean, there was actually quite a bit more, um, like stuff we did beforehand that we. On designs that didn't work, you throw it out and you put it on the shelf for a bit and do something else and come back to it and try it again. So there's, there's a lot of iterating. It was probably five ish years of trying to find Gears of War in the first place, you know, what it's wow. going to be. That's yeah. that's a good chunk uh, of your life, you know, devoted to one project. No. Well, yeah, that, I mean, that was just the first one. Then there was two and three and all that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I did when you're sort of grinding through these do you does it wear on you yeah it can um uh, the first gears of war was you know, you know as proud as i am of it it was a kind of nasty crunch to get it done and it kind of left scars on people but uh the next two weren't as bad but next yeah two. i mean it, it, every project you do uh leaves scars for sure this is how it is yeah yeah, you know, and, and you know, I've worked more in the broadcast advertising kind of area, which has much shorter deadlines. If a project lasts one year, if I'm doing something like an exhibit, I may have a project that lasts one year, but that's about as long as a project ever goes for uh, artists like uh, myself. And so, working in even movies, really, you're talking maybe three years, but AAA games, five years is not unusual. Well, it depends on the what you're doing like the original game was about five years of iterating the, the actual game was probably a year and a half of actual production development of us making real stuff that was going to ship you know and then after that it was like it was like two years to get to gears two then probably another two to get to gears three once you've got it down it's about a two-year cycle right triple okay. a stuff anyway right right making sequels things like that um and all three of those were on the unreal engine correct oh yeah yeah Right. It's a big selling point for Epic. They can say, we're going to license the engine and somebody say, what can it do? And it's like, well, you can do Gears of War. <laughs> you know, which is a huge plus in favor. Well, we've done this one. Yeah, that is a nice uh, nice little marketing gig that you got there with Gears of War. So Epic has released you know, Unreal Engine 4 now, along with Unity has sort of established itself as you know, the, really the top two or uh, available game engines that people are, who are interested in this industry get into and people who are even more established in this industry look to in terms of getting a project done. Uh, looking at your site, it looks like you do you still are involved obviously with Unreal Engine. Do you ever float over to Unity or you pretty much stick with what you know? Well, I use both of them. Um, it, like when it comes to 3D art, it doesn't really matter which one I'm using because I'm not trying to 
script it or make anything happen. So you know, making like a fancy looking crate here where it works the same as it does in Unity, just you gotta flip the normal map and do you know one or two other things. Right, right. There's a so I, I, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty agnostic when it comes to marketplace stuff. It doesn't really matter to me. And so now you really are just creating assets and, and delivering to whatever platform your client wants, as opposed to, and you're not necessarily going in and doing any coding or anything like that anymore. Not generally. Uh, I haven't done coding in a real sense in, in a couple of years now. It's just, well, actually several years now. You know, I, I do it for fun here and there, like on my own little projects, like I'll fire up Unity and do some quick stuff just to keep my, you know, the itch pops up in the back of your head every now and then. You're like, man, I like to cut something. So you sit down and you hack it out for a few hours and get it out of your system. Right, you know, right. Thing. It's nice it's to do some- with you. Yeah, it's nice to do some personal projects. And it's nice to have those skills already. So you're not, a lot of people like myself who have spent their entire in, uh, career as a 3D artist, you know, my top coding days were on an Atari 800 in about 1986 or so. <laughs> and I just, that was it, you know, I never went back to it. And you look at it and you just think that's a time investment. I don't want to, that's you know, a hole I don't want to go down because it just, it's a huge amount of time, it seems like. Um, so it's nice to have those in your back pocket already after having you know done that for years. Yeah, that's yeah, very true. Yeah, it is handy to not have to stare at this huge mountain that I have to climb first before I can even start having fun, you know? Yeah, but it, on the other hand, it's becoming more accessible now. So you know, I do work uh, with, with clients who are using Unity or Unreal, and I'm slowly dipping my foot into that area where I'll export the stuff out of Modo and get in there and actually start learning how to use that, that uh, engine a little bit, just in terms of checking out what the assets look like and getting them loaded up and manipulating them a little bit. And I think that's probably a good foot in the water for a lot of people who are interested in these programs is just download them, create some assets, learn how to get them exported over there, and just sort of gradually build your knowledge from there, I would suspect. Yeah, completely. That's what I always tell people. Like, you should download, of the two, people would think that I would recommend UE4, but I actually kind of promote Unity more. I find it faster just to, you know, you know here's a game object, I'm going to throw a cube in the world, attach a script to it, and let's run the game and see what it does. I mean, the path from, like, zero to having something interesting happening is really short. Yeah, and that's that's what's exciting, right? When, when something right. gets exactly. interesting, yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your workflow, because you do quite a few videos. Uh, you have a popular YouTube channel. You do a lot of tutorials. You, you have some asset packs you have out there. You know, when you, well, I guess let's back up a little bit more. So when you worked on Gears uh, and Unreal back in the old days, what software were you using? Initially, when you became a 3D artist, what software did you use? Well, to be honest, that's, that transition happened around when I started working on Fortnite. On uh, Unreal Tournament and Gears of War, I was primarily a level designer slash programmer. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, so, so on Fortnite, I, you know, when I started doing art there, I uh, was encouraged to use 3D Studio Max. And so I kind of started with that. And then Moto. I think I saw some screenshots of Modo and thought it looked interesting. Because <laughs> has <laughs> a cool look just, to it. No, it does. I mean, I need my apps to look cool for some reason. It's just something in my head. And so I was like, Yo, I like that UI. Let me look at this program. And I started digging into it, and I really liked it. And I sort of, and I think it was cool enough to let me move over to that. That like we don't care as long as the art's getting in the game, that's fine. Right. You know? right. So they were very good about that, and so that allowed me to, yeah, learn. Learn mode instead. So when you're working on Fortnite, and just just uh, if you don't know what Fortnite, is, I'm sure everybody knows what it is by now. I just saw that you know they just released a, an official trailer recently, right? Within the last month or so, a few weeks. I just saw one. Yeah, yeah, it just officially kind of came out. I think about a month ago. Yeah. yeah it's weird. Yeah. Yeah. So so you're working on this, and you're handing off. So you're handing off assets um, out of Moto and. And like you said, as long as you are, you know, giving the people farther down the pipeline what they want, they don't really care what you're using. Do you find that to be a, a common thing in a studio, or do, uh, is there always somebody trying to steer people towards certain applications? Maybe they think it'll be smoother that way. It, from what I'm told, because I've only really worked not at Epic Games. Uh, right. Generally, the studio, you know, it depends how much investment they've got in 
a specific app. Like if they use 3D Studio Max and they have a ton of scripts and stuff that's integral to the pipeline, then uh, you're going to have to use 3D Studio Max. Right. Or Maya or whatever they built their pipeline around. But if it's, I, 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 Epic didn't really have that though. They were fairly hands off when it came to the actual uh, uh, props environment art. So you could do whatever you wanted to as long as you ended up with a viable uh, FBX at the end. Right, so FBX is sort of the format that everybody is is, is using in both. I know Unreal yeah, yeah, and Unity, kind of yeah, it's sort of emerged. It is controlled by Autodesk, but they do a, at least a decent job of keeping other companies abreast of the changes. It seems I know <laughs> I've talked to some developers who are responsible for implementing FBX and other programs. They always have plenty to complain about. It seems like, but it regardless, it's used to have emerged as as the format for for moving assets around. Yeah, it really has. It's definitely, uh, if you put an artist app out that doesn't support FBX, you, you're you're basically killing your app from the you know, word go. You need to support FBX. Right. It's a de facto. Yeah, yeah it, is a, it is a standard. So when you are when you are working on a project and you're given a, a task, say, okay, Warren, you need to make uh, the loot crates for whatever, um, are you given yeah, the new, what, what, what would you call it, loot crates? Like, the new, I don't know, the new horrible <laughs> the thing. Horrible, <laughs> yeah. Everybody's complaining about loot crates. I don't know if you get, it seems like a little tangent here, but it seems like you give a, you know, there's all, there's somebody at the company who's in charge of making money at the company. And so they're going to mm -hmm. see something like microtransactions or loot crates or whatever, horse armor, and they're going to be like, hey, man, it's my job to try and squeeze every penny out of this. So let's do loot crates. Uh, anyway. <laughs> No, on its face, I don't really see anything wrong with it, and I see why they do it. Uh, I just don't, as long as it's stuff that doesn't affect the game, I don't have a huge problem. Like, as long as I'm not, like, you know, I'm going to uh, purchase some, so Crate's going to have a gun that I win every match. I mean, that kind of stuff sucks. But if it's just, you know, like a new cape or something, whatever. Yeah, I think if it's um, in the context of the game, I think if they start showing up in single-player games and, like, ruining the immersive experience, <laughs> Then or something like that, it would be bad. If anyway, you want to spend money, you just need to let them spend the money, you know, because why not? You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, back to the question, I guess. So, if you're making a loot crate, so to, or whatever, um, do you start off with concept art from uh, somebody else in the art department? Do you are you responsible for that yourself? What, what's the first program you jump into to start creating the asset? Well, uh, it depends entirely on the company. I mean, uh, the ideal uh, is that I start off with concept art. <laughs> Right. Uh, usually, I don't, um, because you know the art director just doesn't have the time to generate concept art for everything. So, you'll often I'd say the most common thing I get uh, is a rough description, and they'll send me some Google images they found that kind of look like the thing, and they're like, "Take these and munch them together and make something, you know, that's not these, but uh, looks like these that we can use." <laughs> so, when you're whipping something out. You know, on a just a quick iterative, you know, design basis. Okay, something like this, something like this. Are you jumping into ZBrush or Modo or Photoshop or how do you pump those things out? I'm primarily Modo, so I will jump into Modo and just start have to hack around with shapes and things like that. I usually don't have to iterate too much. Uh, I guess I've been lucky. Just the projects I'm on, you know, the art directors have been pretty clear with me what they want. So. Yeah, I'll do a rough high poly kind of block in and show them that, and they'll be like, "Yeah, that's cool." So then I'll go ahead and finish that. And... Okay, so it, uh, but it's all know, moto for me. I'm not really great with uh, ZBrush, and I'm not really a great drawer. So uh, my sketching all happens in 3D with polygons. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I actually used to be a traditional artist. I was a watercolor painter way back in the day, a wildlife painter, and you know, artists. Uh, draw all the time. Like if you look at my high school notebooks, they're just littered with doodles. Um, but working in 3D for over like, 20 years now, like those skills leave you. <laughs> you know, like you it it becomes harder to draw if you're working. I you know I in 3D with polygons all the time. And and nowadays, like I still do. Uh, it, drawing is a great skill to have. It's an indispensable skill to have, even if just basic drawing. But um, it is often much quicker for me to jump in in, in Modo and just start whipping stuff up in, in polygons or curves than it is um, even with 2D stuff. Like in, in, in a 3D program, it's just, at least for me, it's, 
even if I'm designing a UI or something like that, it's easier to just create basic shapes and do simple arrays and replication and mirroring and things like that than it is in Photoshop or Illustrator. It's just a fast, it's just a more robust program. Yeah, absolutely. So when you, so you, do most of the initial work in Modo, and then you're responsible for modeling and texturing. So I know you've done some substance. You've done some substance tutorials as well on your website. Yeah, Substance is a program you use. Uh, Painter, yeah. Painter, and have you? So did you use Modo's 3D painting prior to that, or did you? When Substance came out, you're like Painter came out. You're like, okay, this looks cool. I'm gonna give this a shot, and then sort of got sucked into that world. Uh. Yeah, when Painter came out, I was pretty interested in it. Um, I remember jumping over to that pretty quick. Uh, before that, it was just all all Photoshop, I think, uh, what I can remember. Uh, the 3D painting in Moto never really worked for me in terms of, of banging out assets quickly. I just wasn't uh, proficient with it, I guess. It just didn't work for me. <laughs> yeah, you know, honestly, it's yeah. a little bit slower uh, in the Moto painting. I always used it just to kind of draw guidelines on my models and then save those and go, then go into Photoshop and, and, and use those as a sort of a template. Um, but Substance Painter seems to have really blossomed in an area as, a, you know, as an affordable 3D asset creation tool or, or a painting tool. And, uh, you know, sent, you know, they've, they've, it seems like uh, Algorithmic has really added a ton of features and is committed to the program. Um, you know, you look around ArtStation or, or some places like that, and there's Substance Painter stuff everywhere. Yeah, I, mean, I haven't used anything but, uh, but Substance Painter for texturing props in at least three, three and a half years. I mean, it's the only thing I, I use. I use it's, Photoshop occasionally for little tiny things, but not much. Right. It seems to be in a really good niche. I mean, you look at 3D painting and, and programs like, uh, and Max and Maya, it's basically non-existent. In Modo, it's there, but it's not necessarily that great. And even ZBrush, it's kind of there, but it's not really that great. Uh, Mari is expensive. And so there's this niche of an affordable 3D uh, painting program that uh, Substance needs to have come in and filled that really, uh, really well. And it doesn't seem like they, you know, it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, maybe they've just captured that market, but that seems like to be the, the go-to program uh, for 3D yeah, painting. It seems like a difficult one to break into now that they've got such a foothold with designer and painter. It's just, I, mean, I just don't think Will upset it eventually, but I don't see anything on the horizon right now. I think they're pretty much the one to learn. Right. And we talked. A little, I talked a little bit about uh, kit bashing and stuff like this with Tor Frick when I talked to him a couple months ago. You know, and it's not just geometry kit bashing, but you know, materials as well. So Substance has this massive library of materials. Do you make use of those and then customize them in your in your workflow, or do you just typically do everything from scratch? I uh, know. I always start with the presets. Um, you know, I'll throw some presets on it, uh, mix and match them. You change sliders and stuff. You know, like you're able to. And when I get something that I really like, I will typically will save that up to a smart materials. I have my own custom library, uh, usually grouped by project because each project's got its own look. Like they want stuff super dirty and they want stuff kind of, uh, kind of retro, you know, whatever. Right. But yeah, yeah, as I cope with something cool that I want to reuse in the future, I make my own smart materials and stuff and I build up a library. So yeah, it's essentially kid passion. Yeah, it's, it's it's similar to that, right? And um, it's really it's it's weird because there there was a small there's a short phase in the industry. Um, honestly, it was kind of around. Uh, it was a while ago. It's kind of like when Paint Effects came out for Maya. Paint Effects. I don't know if you ever use Maya. Paint Effects was this really interesting technology, and it came with a ton of presets. And you saw them right after it came out. You saw them all over the place, right? You saw everyone was just using Paint Effects, and there was sort of this pullback from the industry saying, oh, that's cheating. You're just, you're just using presets. Using presets is cheating. And, yeah. you know, I, as somebody who actually has to sit, you know, sit in front of a computer for eight to 10 hours a day and is responsible for delivering artwork and assets, you're going to use whatever's at your disposal. And I, it's nice to see that being able to grab kitbash geometry, materials, whatever, uh, grab HDRs from libraries, and use them straight, you know, straight away, um, is an accepted form of asset creation now, and encouraged, and is a blossoming area rather than this sort of frowned upon. Let me see your wireframes, you know, sort of, sort of thing. Going on. 
Yeah, well, I think there's been sort of, there's been, um, like with companies and pipelines, they've been accepting the substance stuff now as you know, you know, as the norm. And so um, I know Epic Games, I watched some presentations on, uh, on Paragon, and they have like this whole library of, of smart materials set up that they use on everything pretty much. And you know, it just saves the artist's time. Like you don't have to go hunting up your own leather, your own chrome, your own whatever. Just use the one from the library. You know, if you have to customize it a bit, fine. But generally, it just speeds things along, and it's it's good for everybody. Yeah, and it's nice to see the industry start to converge. It's not exactly the same, but to to kind of move towards the, the gravitational pull of a PBR workflow, where you have a or simplified uh, base material with a uh, roughly similar channels between engines like Unreal or Unity or uh, Crytek or, or the uh, id1, uh, idtech, you know, they all have a, a similar, not exact, but similar workflow in terms of that. You know, roughness does the same thing, you know, it's something you look for, metallic uh, textures do, you know, it's nice to see the industry yeah. converge in that area. Um, in terms of substance, in terms of uh, well, just in terms of like kit bashing, I'm just going to stay on this topic for a second. And you know, we have a, a, a shop at Pixel Fondue. It's not really a shop, but just it's a, a little library of links at Pixel Fondue where you can, if you make, um, you know, kit bash uh, geometry or materials or whatever, we'll, we'll, we'll link to you there. And uh, at least probably a two thirds of the entire store, where there's plugins and everything else, is all kit bash stuff. I mean, it's something people can make to get out there, make a little money on the side, uh, build a bit of a uh, a reputation in the industry and be a part of the community. I think it's. I think it's great. Yeah, the polystyrene stuff. I assume is what you're talking about primarily. A lot of yeah, a lot of polystyrene stuff. So the polystyrene uh, obviously initiated a lot of the kit bashing stuff. But even just the the move towards a boolean again, boolean workflows used to be sort of considered cheating, right? <laughs> oh, you're just you're just hacking that shit together. What are you doing? Anybody can. Or do that. just bad. It's like no, you're ruining the model. Stop. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> right. Bad practice, yeah. uh, and that's that's no longer the case. Yeah. So I know you've done. You I think you work with William uh, a little. You and William know each other, right? You work with each other a little bit and and helping give him some feedback on uh, polystyrene and and Mopilians and things like that. Yes, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's really that's definitely um, done a lot for the moto community, but just in general for, across platforms, um, you know, this is this workflow has really taken off. And, and other, you just even when Polystyne came out, you know, you could Polystyne in Blender now, you could Polystyne in uh, Maya and, and and that kind of thing. Um, I am going to mention uh, Emmanuel over Pixel Fondue. I told him, you know, he had just released a live link between Substance and Mo. Actually, I think it's a live link between. Substance and either Moto Maya Blender. So it's the same interface, depending on whatever program you use. And I know you had taken a look at the video, but I'll link to that um, in the description as well. But as you said, like anything that allows you to quickly transfer data is good, right? Yeah, any kind of live reloading, I'm a huge fan of. That's why uh, one of the handy things with Unity is every time you change something and you go back to Unity, it's, just, it's like, hang on, you know, done. Yeah. Well, this is super handy. And um, you know, I wish something like Unreal had that, what it does, but it's it's, it's kind of a, that's kind of a bother to set up. It's kind of a bother to set up. Are you talking, yeah, about, I mean, the, are you talking about the Moto Unreal Bridge? No, no, just uh, a UE4 itself has a hot reload that it can, oh, right. uh, can monitor directories, but you have to tell it specifically which directories to monitor, and it's a bit of a hassle. But yeah, any kind of hot reload, I'm all about it. I, saves me having to click that re-import button 5,000 times during the course of a prop. Yeah, all those textures and everything else. Yeah, I know, any, any, assay, any change you make, yeah. So I, that stuff is great. So I would check out the, uh, we'll, we'll do a little more, we'll do a story on that in, in Pixel Fondue, but I think that's sort of where the workflow is going and working between applications. It really seems like the, um, with programs like ZBrush and Substance and even some of the UV mapping tools, um, there's a place, a, a really definite place in a 3D artist workflow for task-specific tools. And getting data in and out quickly, uh, live especially, is without having to save and reload, um, seems to be the way to go. Yeah, I, I would agree. Faster yeah, better. That's all better, yeah. In fact, actually, I uh, spoke with Shane at Foundry the last uh, uh, live stream we did. He mentioned uh, right now Moto has an Unreal 
bridge, but really what they did is is the whole team over at Foundry, including I think I think it was actually initiated by members from the Nuke team, were just creating an API for data transfer between programs, probably initially for their own programs like Moto Nuke, Mari, that kind of thing, and they created one for Unreal. But he mentioned that you're going to see more of these, maybe Unity, maybe even Maya. I suspect. Uh, something with, uh, you know, uh, maybe an improved ZBrush, something like that. So something to look forward to, I think, and if you're uh, an artist who spends all day <laughs> cranking out assets. Um, I wanted to jump back from uh, the nuts and bolts of creating stuff and just, just touch on Fortnite a little bit. So how much time did you spend on Fortnite? Well, I was, uh, was probably three years, maybe, something like that. Three, oh, three years, really? So you really spent maybe quite a bit of time. Years. Wow. So I, you know, when I saw that, I typically stay away from multiplayer games nowadays just because I, I can't do the time suck with it. You know, I, yeah. I, prefer, yeah, I do just single no, player, I single player games I can win and, and, and put away. Um, but I looked at Fortnite and it reminded me a little bit. I remember, again, this is like old man gamer talk, but when Half-Life 2 came out back in the day, uh, there was a section of the game at Nova Prospect where you are, everybody who's played the game knows what I'm talking about. You set up the turrets and you're attacked by waves of man hacks. And if you're you're clever, if you played it enough, you can sort of, in the, before you get down into the arena, you can toss all the giant desks and tables and all these file cabinets down into the area and then go down there and build up uh, barricades and uh, over your, you know, around your turrets and, and, and uh, to keep yourself safe from all the drones that came in to try and kill you. And I always thought that would be so like a really cool multiplayer game. Like, yeah, we could just you know build up, use the gravity gun to build up uh, barricades, and then you know to face the waves of enemies. It just I haven't played Fortnite, but looking at the trailer, it, it just reminded me of that. I mean, was there any inspiration behind the creation of that game that you know of? Well, I was there during the initial prototyping. It it kind of came out of a game jam that we had uh, internally within Epic, and that was one of the you know, the ideas that got proposed and. Uh, Wait, game jam? Is that when everybody gets to throw out their idea? Yeah, they spent a week and they said, "You yeah, go ahead and do all your crazy, uh, your craziest ideas, and the following week we'll look at them, review them, and figure out which ones you know, possibly we want to move forward with." And, oh, that's cool. And Fortnite was kind of one of those. Yeah, kind of immersed out of that. Okay, so it was actually. I think it was actually. I think it was kind of. Um, it was Lee Perry that came up with the idea originally, if I'm remembering correctly. And I think he I referenced uh, uh, the Dungeon Keeper games as sort of an inspiration for it. Oh, Dungeon Keeper. Okay, right. Just like that. you build up your world and then you know you play. Right, right. You know, defend against the creatures. It's it. It was so long ago. Now I'm having hazy memories, but. <laughs> I'm actually going to uh, jump to a uh, screen share real quick and just show some of uh, Warren's artwork. So bear with me for one second while we talk. So you don't have to stare at our lovely faces this entire time. All right, so we're good to go. This is, so actually I'm starting on this one because uh, this is actually a screenshot from within Unreal Engine. But I thought just as a piece of art, um, you really, I love, I love mood, I love atmosphere, and I love lighting in artwork and this one this uh sort of moving day image you have you have a number of them here i thought was really cool what uh what inspired this well i wanted to... oh, let's see well i wanted <laughs> to have a uh, a thing to put in my portfolio that demonstrated that i could do a real environment art like a whole scene uh -huh. and i also like doing the um environmental storytelling thing like looking at the scene you can kind of pick up what's going on you know what happened you know before i took this screenshot you know, what were the people doing you know and it's it's moving day i love environmental storytelling so, yeah i love it yeah so it's going to stop halfway you see the pizza box and the box cutters sitting around it looks like they're about halfway done and that kind of thing yeah and it has a bit of a the lighting gives a bit of a a bit of a sorrowful mood to it, in my opinion, because it is sad when you, you know, move out of your out of your place. Unless your place just sucks and you're happy to move out of there, which sometimes happens too. I mean, it can be read two ways. It could be moving out or moving back in, right? This could be happy. Oh yeah, that's so, true. Oh, you got a night night scene there. So to create the uh, drop cloth over the box, did you just model that by hand, or did you use something like Marvelous Designer? I believe that was Marvelous Designer. Yeah. Oh, so, oh it was Marvelous Designer. So. Um, is that a program? I haven't actually used that. Pascal, who does some Pixel Bondu tutorials, has done a number of marvelous tutorials. Uh, they're really good if you haven't seen them. 
uh, it looks like a program I want to kind of find a use for. Is it something where you can actually get usable results out of it fairly quickly if you watch a few tutorials, or if you pick it up, are you looking at like two weeks of your life? Well, I would say you could definitely pick it up quickly. Uh, for up. environment artists like me, like the only thing I want to use it for, um, and this is limiting myself, but just like whenever I have to have a piece of cloth that lays over something, I will use uh, Marvelous for that. Right. Or like if I have to put something on a clothesline and have it kind of drape realistically, you know, I'll use Marvelous for that. But there's a lot more complicated stuff you can get into. Like some guys do like uh, spaceships with like uh, the cloth interiors and like all the folds and the stitching. They put all that into Marvelous and it just all simulates out. But that's uh, that, uh, that's beyond my skill set. Yeah, I've seen that. Those are awesome. In fact, those are some of the coolest spaceship designs mm -hmm. I've seen. People incorporating cloth and fabrics into a spaceship design. Um, and I saw, yeah, they, it also, I think they, it, it's sort of the de facto or go-to program now. It just seems like for gaming in general, like it's been adopted by the gaming industry. I've seen, you know, The Witcher yeah, 3 and, and I think Deus Ex and some of these other games um, use it uh, use it for their, for their cloth and costumes. In fact, actually just game fashion design, if you're creating a, an immersive experience like Deus Ex or The Witcher and you have this consistent, you know, there's a few, there's a, art style going on there that it almost you know did you have i mean i'm just sort of sort of popping in my head but did you have like people with fashion experience working in a game studio or do you just have artists who are interested in just sort of freelance it and try to come up with something cool uh character art was never my thing yeah um as far as i know the guys just kind of they came up with you know, the clothing on their own. I don't think we had any kind of consulting or anything fashion-wise or whatever. Uh, and there was no Marvelous designer back then. That was something I picked up uh, after leaving Epic. Right. Right. And I see, and I look at that stuff. I mean, I look at something like Witcher 3 or, or Deus Ex or some of these um, where they put, obviously put a huge amount of effort into the detail of the clothing. And I just think, like, how could they not have consulted with somebody in that industry to create something so detailed. It's like architecture. There's always somebody who knows something about architecture working at a game in a, you know, a game company when they're creating buildings or houses and things like that. It's, Bob, you always got to have somebody to tell you when something is not you, uh, not realistic or not structurally sound. You got to have somebody around. <laughs> right, right. So but looking, that'll never stand there like that. You can't build that uh, fine, whatever, so you go back and change it. Right. I know. It used to be you just make a box with some windows by now. Um, so looking at this image, you got the Commodore 64 there. You got some Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, this is very Ready Player One to me. You know, I think this is all coming back. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, actually, this scene was... Uh, I was at Epic Games at the time when I did this. And on Polycount, they were running a contest, you know, about to build a throne room. Uh -huh. And uh, Allegra Rhythmic was... Of was sponsoring the competition, and so we all got like a beta copy of Substance Painter, and that's how I textured everything. Oh, okay. Well, not everything, most most stuff. And uh, this scene placed tenth, which meant it was meant that I got a free license to Substance. Oh, nice! So, all right, we've yeah, got. Is... I'm going to break go this down. I'm, I'm going to break this down real quick. I'm going to see what all. Okay, we got Ferris Bueller. We've got. Is this Ultima One? On the screen, uh, I guess Questron or, or oh, Questron! No. I remember that. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is uh, 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 that's Legacy of the Ancients. Now I remember that was one of my favorite games on the Commodore. Legacy of the Ancients. I did not play that one. I did play Questron. <laughs> yeah, yeah Questron I, was awesome too. But yeah. you can see the Legacy code wheel right down beside the keyboard there on the left, the black thing. Oh, okay, that, yeah, uh, yeah. That, All right. Yeah, that was the anti-piracy measure back then. Oh right, yeah, I remember that stuff. You had like, uh, like the little filters you looked through, the code wheel. <laughs> oh my god! Yes, you got turned to this page and spin the wheel three times, and what's the word that appears, and that kind of thing. Uh huh. You got the disk drive. You have a disk drive and tape drive, or those just both disk drives? Uh, there is a tape drive somewhere in the seat. I think it's kind of tucked back behind the monitor a little bit, but yeah. Yeah, and then we've got uh, Dungeons and Dragons, of course. And yeah, I just decided to go full '80s nerd on this. Just make it like you know, uh, the '80s desk that I always wanted when I was, you know, a kid. <laughs> yeah, totally. You got the tapes. You got the Pac-Man, uh, the boombox. Uh, man, yeah. So this was this was basically what I had, except I had an Atari 800, and that was <laughs> yeah. 
So Zork one, two, and three. So I actually, this is a funny. My my daughter is twelve. She just read Ready Player One. She had an interest and she's she's she loves 80s music and I'm like okay she's into this so i thought okay i'll try to find zork for you and i did find you can get zork online and it's it's full-on zork you can just you know the text game uh but you can't save it it's still looking to save to like a floppy external floppy drive nice <laughs> so she played it pretty like you know, for played through like uh for hours so it was doing quite well and then i think my wife closed the browser window <laughs> After lots of screaming, there was uh, that was it. Never got back into it. <laughs> oh man! But yeah, I remember the day of Zork. Oh, okay. Sorry. I just uh, I love retro gaming, and uh, it's funny. You look at like Questron or uh, what was the name of this one again? Uh, Legacy of the Ancients. Legacy of the Ancients, or even the, the early Ultimas. Those were, in a lot of ways, or probably in, in every way, the first open world games. Where you just jump in and kind sure. of yeah, you can go pretty much anywhere you wanted on the map. So yeah, you can go wherever you yeah, want, take some quests, do some dungeons. I mean, that's where so the I've never thought of it that way. Yeah, it's like the you know, it's not like open world gaming was a new was something that was invented with Far Cry or something. It was just this was uh, this was it. I mean, the ultimate was open world game. You, you know, it's sort of a, a really cool thing. Um, all right, so I don't know what we covered here. We've got retro gaming. We've got current. What games are you playing nowadays? Do you still find time to play games, or are you just uh, spend most of your time making them and not not so much playing them? I spend most of my time making them, to be honest. Uh, that's kind of my entertainment. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I've really been into Quake Champions, actually, lately. Quake Champions, oh. Uh, for, well, it's just a jump in. You know, I can play a couple of rounds and then go to bed or whatever. It's it's simple, and I don't have to get too, uh, get too invested in it. Right. Wait, is that the new one? <laughs> That's out, or is that a? Yeah, yeah, oh, it's out. It's out. Oh, okay. I didn't realize well, I it was out. out. <laughs> I'm not really. I can't remember. Well, That's... it's clearly out in some in some manner. I've got it installed off of Steam. I'm not sure if it's still early access or not. Maybe it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, Tappy Chicken is this from the uh, Doom franchise? The Punch a Chicken? Was that no? Actually, one? that was one of the demos that they did for uh, uh, from. I think I lost you there, Warren. Let me jump back to yes, that was, uh, the lead artist of Epic Game called. Sorry, uh, that was a project that the lead artist did uh, back uh, in the early days, like a Flappy Bird clone called Happy Chicken. Oh, okay. So we've got. And uh... so we, and, yeah, and so we did a. Uh, Uh, it's in my portfolio because that's one of the first actual props I was able to build uh, for Epic. Because uh -huh. it came up, uh, they were going to do the stage presentation. I forget who it was for now. And the characters were going to almost have a fight down in the sewer, but then they stopped and they played Tappy Chicken instead. <laughs> and they needed to have this inner key cabinet. So I was like, please let me build the cabinet. I want to do something. And they're like, fine, go ahead, build the cabinet. <laughs> go ahead, build the cabinet. Uh, that was cool. That's yes, cool. So I, I noticed you're using. Oh, I noticed you're using Sketchfab as well here. Is that correct? Is this Sketchfab at the top? Uh, no, no, it's it's probably Marmoset Viewer. Oh, Marmoset Viewer. Oh, okay, Marmoset. Yeah, I see a yeah. lot of Marmoset on ArtStation, Sketchfab as well. It seems like uh, there's a couple of different options or decent options for showcasing 3D assets online now. Uh, where even just a few years ago, we didn't really have that. They never could agree yeah, on it. The whole concept of clicking this window and being able to spin the spin the model around in 360 degrees is such, you know, it's such a game changer for reviewing portfolios. It's, you, know, you can't hide anything anymore. Oh, totally. And you can show off everything as well, right? I, I was actually pretty. I was on Sketchfab just last night uh, at a client. I thought it would be a good uh, uh, destination for a client's work. And I was actually like, I remember when Sketchfab first came out. There, there was like five models on it, you know. There's just tons of awesome stuff on there. Now I was actually shocked at not just like how good some of the models look, but how fast they loaded up. I mean, it 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 goes really quickly. It just you know blows up the model, and you could you know change the yeah. lighting. Uh, it, you know that's a great thing actually. You know I think there was a Sketchfab exporter for Moto. Maybe there still is. I'll have to take a look at that. Uh, there probably there, is. Yeah. yeah, something in there. Um, so in terms of sort of future workflow, let's like move back to actual asset creation for a little bit here. We got another maybe ten minutes. Um, 
what are some things you'd like to see in future versions of Moto Substance ZBrush, the, your day-to-day -day programs that would make your life easier, make things move along a little faster? I think in terms of, uh, God, this is a question I get asked and I never have an answer. <laughs> I'd like, I mean, just for like uh, the nuts and bolts stuff, one thing I would like you know, it, I have Moto is some ability to just take my sub D mesh or my bully mesh, whatever I've got going on that's all set up, you know, with edge weighting or whatever. Yeah. I'm sorry. I think we lost you there a bit. I think your uh, connection dropped a little. Um, Not surprising. I don't know. It might be better to, I don't know if it's better to, well, you sound good now. Why don't you, why don't you give that to us one more time? I think we lost most of it. Okay. Well, just on the sensor too. So uh, the one thing that, uh, yeah, that does bother me is so you want to bake a mesh in substance manner. Uh, currently you have to freeze the mesh before you export because it won't respect your edge weights. It won't respect your sub D or any of that kind of stuff. Right. So you're freezing the mesh and exporting it. That's a huge hassle. And I wish there was some way to make that easier. It would just, you would freeze it behind the scenes as an option or something or. Well, you know what I think, you, I think you might be able to do is use a mesh operation uh, a freeze mesh operation right now. It's it, it, That's uh, idea. yeah. So well, right now there is no. Right now there will be eventually soon enough. I hope um, mesh operations that will change a polygon type to Catmull Clark and, and and back and forth. You could just click them on and off. But it seems like you should be able to have a freeze mesh operation at the top of the mesh. Or actually, the way I would actually recommend doing something like that is uh, just have an empty mesh and do a merge mesh into that one with the, the one you're working on, your live mesh, and have the whatever freeze mesh op um, that it works best with whatever program you're going to be setting out to on the merge mesh. So I'm not sure that's quite possible right now. I'll have to take a look. But uh, Matt Cox, if you're watching, there you go. <laughs> Something to work on uh, for the next version of Moto, um, having freeze mesh operations suitable for whatever program you're going out to. Warren is not there. It is Friday the 13th. Perhaps we've lost him. Um, okay, well, we may be wrapping this up and doing a, uh, doing a, just doing a wrap up and text in a bit here. Okay, so I think we're gonna, let me move on to something else and we'll just wrap this one up. Um, I believe next week, uh, Pixel Fondue, we're gonna have Shane and some of the Foundry crew back. We're gonna be talking about Moto 11.2, which is in beta right now, public beta. If you are a current subscriber, can we just wait three minutes, says Daniel. Daniel, I think we can. I'm just going to kill time here blabbing for three minutes, and then we'll see. Warren dropped off, but he may he's probably going to try to reconnect, so we'll get back to him in a minute. So I'm just going to give the, sh the rundown for next week. Um, uh, Foundry people will be back with uh, Moto 11.2 launch. Oh, Warren might be coming back. And we'll be going over the new features there, and it will become publicly available, I think, in a week or two. So, Warren, are we back? He seems to be slowly coming back to life over on his side in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, so we were talking about a couple of workflow issues. One is, you, you know, a, a better way to get uh, stuff in and out without having to freeze meshes or save multiple versions. So live linking is maybe one way, but you need to support features like edge weighting and, and, and things like that. But I also noticed you're, you're watching some of your videos on your channel. You're, you seem to have a highly customized workflow. Is that something that uh, you've built up over time or do you immediately jump in and customize stuff? Or uh, how do you, what's your theory on that? Well, I kind of have a backwards approach. I try not to modify apps if I can at all help it. But the one app that I accept for that is Moto because I'm in it all the time. Right. And uh, so what I so, so my current workflow has been like an evolution of over the years of using it, like pattern where I'll sit down, I've done all week long, and what sucked and what didn't, and that kind of thing. And I'll make some tweaks to whatever I've got going on in terms of forms or hotkeys or whatever. Right. So using that kind of evolution, that's. Uh, that's where my moto setup has come from. So people ask me for my config file. I'm like, uh, no. it's not that. Yes, sharing configuration files, not a good idea. Uh, I think um, 
you know, Moto is highly customizable. One of the things I'd like to see in Moto, and maybe this is something Pixel Thought New can 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 move towards, is creating some cheat sheets because I think there's some really useful and really obvious uh, keyboard shortcuts that people aren't aware of and um, customizations that you can do that you sometimes forget about. If you highly customize your program, uh, you'll one of the problems with that is you'll you forget what you do, and there's so many different keyboard combinations that. Um, it can get a little dicey. So having some sort of uh, panel that could put just a palette or a window or a card view um, that gives you a bit of a cheat sheet that you can keep open in a panel or off to the side to, to remind you of uh, keep various keyboard shortcuts or um, customizations that you've done would be would be nice. You back, Warren? All right, I think we're probably going to, I think oh, we are exactly at an hour, so I think we're going to have to sign off here. We'll try to get Warren back for the sign out. Uh, good thing is Warren is uh, on YouTube all the time. So we're talking about his workflows there. He has tons of YouTube material and tutorials that you can get to and a link to that as well. Michael is saying founder should hire Warren to set up default keyboard shortcuts. You know, I think I think there's a problem though. Like th there's always a balance, Michael, between having an expert user working the program and having a new user, even if you're an experienced user from another program. Uh, one of the nice things about standard Moto keyboard shortcuts is that they, they, there, there has been, thanks to Maya in some part, a bit of an industry standard um, in terms of just basic translation keyboard shortcuts and selection keyboard shortcuts that I think are, are really important. Um, but yeah, I think you know a lot of times, like Tor mentioned this as well, people ask him for his customizations or his config files. You're just asking for trouble. That's not the way to go about it. The way the way to go about it is to slowly build up your customizations over time. Um, and quite frankly, Moto, as flexible as it is, it needs to have a little bit better method of uh, customizing the program and exporting custom configs because you don't want to get into a situation where you need to blow away your config if there's a problem with the plugin you've gotten or a new you've updated the version and things are messed up. You don't want to blow everything away just to get back to the standard version. Uh, Warren, can you? Are you back? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. So I was thinking we would wrap it up. It's been an hour, and the uh, live streaming gods seem to be uh, smiling for a brief <laughs> moment. So smiling for a brief moment. So, um, so yeah, let's wrap it up. I think. Uh, thanks for coming on and. Mm -hmm. We'll link to all your stuff. Um, what we've got, uh, check out Fortnite. Is there a demo out on Steam or anything like that you could take a look at? I uh, get the Epic Games launcher and uh, the Battle Royale modes in there and stuff. Yeah, but I'm currently you know, working on player and none of the Battle Royale. So I'm going to translate that. I caught half the robot speech. Yeah, the first one. Got the first part. So you're working on Player Unknown's Battleground. So PUBG got the shirt on. Okay, Warren's got the PUBG shirt on. So take a look at that. Um, look in the comments section of the video, Warren. If you have anything specific you want to link to there, any current work, put it in the comments section. And we will see everybody on Slack on Pixel Fondue. Yep. All right, Warren. Thanks a lot, and uh, look for us next week with uh, Shane from Foundry. Okay. Thank you, Pixel Fondue. We are out. Yum, yum.